Hi everyone. Hope you're all safe and well this week. Um, thank you also for your prayers uh, for me. Uh, when I woke up a week ago Sunday, uh, I woke up to a spinning room uh, which wouldn't stop. A bad case of vertigo which uh, lasted into Monday. But very thankful for your prayers, for the Lord's uh, healing hand and touch, uh, feeling much, much better. We've now completed week six of sheltering in place, our response to this coronavirus pandemic. And in such a short amount of time, the costs of this crisis uh, have grown staggeringly. Where we stand now, at the end of this past week, uh, over 64,000 deaths in the United States and worldwide over 242,000 uh, deaths. People have lost their lives. In terms of uh, confirmed cases, uh, at the end of this past week, the United States had 1 million plus confirmed cases, people with the virus. Worldwide, 3.4 million confirmed cases. And then this past week, we got more bad news. Uh, 30 million people now unemployed because of businesses shutting down, which represents 18% of all working Americans. And while the infection curve has now seemed to have flattened, and our healthcare system, our hospitals, uh, thankfully, have not been overwhelmed. There has grown a reasonable sense of doubt or questions that have been raised as to uh, the prolonged necessity of continuing on with these very severe lockdown measures. And case in point, uh, this past week, our governor of California, Governor Newsom, he ordered the closing of the Orange County beaches uh, because of the crowds that had gathered uh, last weekend during the heat wave and the lack of social dis distancing or what he thought was that. Uh, but there's been a lot of pushback uh, to the governor's office because of, again, the restrictive measures and the doubt that has been raised. Doubt is something that we're all very familiar with. It's an inevitable part of being human. This is the definition of doubt. It's to question or to be uncertain of the truth of something. Again, the definition of doubt to question or to be uncertain of the truth of something. And if you have kids or grandkids, it's hearing the why question. Why? Why? That's doubt. And in the spiritual realm, a couple of things. Doubt is not the same thing as unbelief. Doubt is not the same thing as unbelief. Unbelief represents a closed heart spiritually. It represents spiritual blindness, uh, resistance to God and his truth. Doubt, again, is more about having questions, which could even include a questioning of faith. But doubt, in doubt, we can approach the Lord God with our questions. And the essence of faith is about living with our questions. If we were to have all the answers, all the answers to our questions, would there be a need for faith? However, doubt, if it's allowed to uh, fester or to go unresolved, it can have some very serious consequences. It can lead us away from the truth, lead us into a spirit of unbelief. There's a term uh, that originated in 18th century Europe but well known to most, if not all of us today. And that term is beyond the shadow of a doubt. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. And this term uh, basically was used as an expression of knowing or experiencing something to be certain or true. Knowing or experiencing something to be certain or true, which went beyond the uncertainty the darkness or the shadow of doubt. And that was the challenge presented for one of Jesus' followers that we're going to look at this morning, a man by the name of Thomas. After seeing his master, his rabbi and friend, die on the cross at Calvary, 
a horrible and traumatic event, Thomas was challenged to live beyond the shadow of doubt, to believe that Jesus was alive, that he was resurrected from the dead. And that's also our challenge as Jesus followers in this very strange and traumatic season when life doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. It's to live beyond the shadow of our doubt. Our passage this morning, it's taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. And a portion of the passage was shown at the beginning of the video. I'd again encourage all of you to read uh, the full 10 verses of this wonderful story. The setting of our passage, it takes place shortly after Jesus' death on the cross on Good Friday and after his resurrection from the dead on that first Easter morning. As we know, we looked at this passage earlier, three women who went to the tomb early morning on that Easter Sunday had reported to the disciples that the heavy stone that had sealed the entrance to the tomb had been mysteriously rolled away. The women also reported that angels had met and told them that Jesus was not there, that he was not dead, he was alive, and to go and tell the disciples the news. And then from our passage of last week, we looked at two other followers of Jesus who later on that same Easter Sunday, as they were walking uh, from Jerusalem back to Emmaus, they encountered a stranger. And this stranger apparently had not heard the news or events of the past week concerning Jesus. That stranger listened to their story of the unjust punishment, the killing of an innocent and righteous man. The stranger listened to how these two followers' own hopes and dreams through Jesus' life had been crushed, came to a shattering end. And then of how this stranger then began to carefully explain to these two followers from the scriptures, beginning with Moses and then all of the prophets of Israel about God's Messiah, the same Jesus of Nazareth about the Messiah's intended suffering, which was a part of God's rescue plan for the, human, for the human race, and about Jesus then entering his glory, the Messiah entering his glory, which was the Son of God after his resurrection from the dead, his ascension back to heaven to take his rightful place, the throne of God. And as the spiritual passion of these two followers, as it was raised and their hearts burned, they wanted more of what they heard from the stranger. So they invited him to have a, a bite with them, a bite of dinner, and then to stay overnight, continue their conversation. And we're told that when the stranger took the bread, broke it, and gave thanks to God, Suddenly, the two followers, their spiritual eyes were opened and they recognized this man no longer as a stranger, but as their Lord Jesus, who was indeed alive. And then just like that, Jesus disappeared and he was gone. But the strangers knew what they had to do and they raced back to tell the disciples the good news. Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he was alive. Which brings us up to the setting for this morning's passage. Again, it's the evening of the first day of the week, Resurrection Sunday, where we're told that the disciples were together. They were hiding out, trying to keep a low profile in the house that was believed to be the same house where the Last Supper had taken place. They were all together in the upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews discovering them. And then Jesus suddenly appeared before his disciples, saying, peace be with you, peace be with you. And after he had said this, Jesus showed them, showed them his hands and his side, the hands that had been pierced by the nails and the 
side that had been pierced by the tip of a Roman soldier's spear. The disciples were told, were overjoyed when they saw for themselves that their Lord was indeed alive. And then Jesus, were told, commissioned them, and this was, again, prior to Pentecost, were told that he breathed his spirit into them. Great news and good news rocked and filled that Jerusalem house. However, one of the disciples was not there to experience it, and that was Thomas. Talk about missing out. And later, after Thomas had returned, the disciples tried their best, tried in vain to tell him the good news that they had all really seen Jesus and he was alive. But Thomas responded back uh, to his fellow disciples with his famous or infamous statement of doubt. He said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Important for all of us to remember, important for all of us to remember that the Lord Jesus never gave up on Thomas. He never gave up on him, just like he never gives up on any of us. So the question, how did he help Thomas to overcome and to move beyond the shadow of doubt? couple of truths that we can take from our passage, the first one being this. Jesus patiently invited Thomas to come and to see for himself. The Lord Jesus patiently invited Thomas to come and see for himself. We often think of Thomas's temperament as coming across as kind of a natural pessimist. And if you're familiar with the Winnie the Pooh uh, cartoon or story, uh, similar maybe to the character of the donkey Eeyore, very pessimistic, kind of negative. But in more likelihood, we could think of Thomas as a courageous realist, a courageous realist. Remember again, Thomas saw from a distance that traumatic and horrible image, seeing his master, his friend and rabbi crucified by the Romans. So naturally following Jesus' death, Thomas saw his own hopes, his own dreams through Jesus' life being shattered, being crushed. Thomas became lost, lost in his own sorrow and grief, his despair and his fear of the future without the Lord Jesus. And Thomas, probably very rationally and realistically, he probably found it difficult, if not impossible, to accept those stories shared to the disciples of Jesus being alive. Doubting and pushing aside uh, the news that was just too good for him to be true. But the Lord Jesus, in his great patience, he didn't leave Thomas where he was at. He didn't leave him in the shadow of unresolved doubt. We're told that a week later, the disciples, this time including Thomas, were in the same house again, same upper room with the doors locked. And then, then Jesus again came and he stood among them, his beloved friends. And he again gave them the same greeting, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Or in other translations, may God give you every good thing. This second visit, and I would call it the second touch of grace, it was for Thomas. The Lord Jesus was there to patiently invite Thomas out of his doubt and to see for himself, see for himself that Jesus truly was alive. The resurrection was true to invite him to see for himself that Jesus' death on the cross, it was God's rescue plan for the human race, God's forgiveness of humanity's sins. To come and see for himself that the power of God was even greater than the powers of sin and death. 
and then to see for himself that it was okay to dream again and to hope again. But for Thomas to dream and hope, not for himself, but in the Lord, for the Lord's best and for his greater will to be done. And likewise for us, if or when we find ourselves stuck in the shadow of doubt, unresolved doubt, the Lord Jesus doesn't want us to stay where we're at with that unresolved doubt, to have it fester. But instead, that he also patiently invites each of us to not be afraid and to approach him and to draw close to him. We do that through prayer. We do that through spending time in his word in the Bible. We do that through simply being still. Being still to know that he is God. The Lord Jesus also patiently invites us to release, to give up to him things like our despair, our fears of the future, and our doubts and our questions, to give those to him. And he may again not answer those questions, but we can still release it into his presence and experience his peace. And he also patiently invites us to dream again, to hope again, but similar to Thomas, like Thomas, to dream and hope in the Lord that his best would be done and that his greater will would be done. For the word of God says this regarding God's patience from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, to know God. To move beyond the shadow of, the, of doubt, Jesus patiently invited Thomas, and he patiently invites us to come and see for ourselves. Another truth we can take from our passage this day is this. Jesus also challenged Thomas based upon the evidence, based upon the evidence to step beyond the shadow of unresolved doubt. Again, Jesus challenged Thomas based upon the evidence to step beyond the shadow of unresolved doubt and to believe. For Thomas, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection from the dead was indisputable. He was right in front of him. Thomas was able to see firsthand that Jesus was definitely not dead, but he was alive. And Though scripture does not specifically record it, Thomas also was most likely able to personally touch the marks of the nails, where the nails went into Jesus' hands, and the wound from the spear tip, which was the reality of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus' challenge, his exhortation to Thomas, was now stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. His challenge was for Thomas to embrace him, not with unbelief, but with faith. With faith. And in re response was recorded what I believe is the greatest confession of a faithful witness to the risen Jesus. Thomas replied this, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Thomas had stepped beyond the dark shadow of doubt and into the light, into the warmth, and into the truth of the Son of God. And likewise, for all of us, the Lord Jesus challenges us, exhorts us, no matter where we might find ourselves this day, to move beyond 
the shadow of our festering or unresolved doubt and into the light of his truth. To move beyond or out of that shadow of doubt and into the light of his truth. And Jesus, the Lord Jesus, leaves that choice to each of us. He doesn't force it upon us because of his unconditional love. And he still reveals himself to all those who have an open heart and all those who take the time to examine the evidence for faith, the evidence for belief. And that evidence includes these things how the Lord has made himself known through all of creation, his handiwork. We look at the works of his hands in all of nature, the stars at night, the sky, the oceans, the mountains, the miracle of birth, the lives of others, all of creation, all of creation, his handiwork. His evidence how it has revealed himself also through his word, the living and unchanging truth of the Bible. We have that also as evidence for faith and for belief. Evidence also such as how the Lord has revealed himself through human testimony, through eyewitness accounts. We have the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry eyewitness accounts. And we also have evidence such as how the Lord reveals himself through things such as miracles, dreams, visions, and also through the lives of other faithful believers, his church still today. All of that evidence for faith and belief. Jesus challenged Thomas based upon the evidence to step beyond or step out of the shadow of unresolved doubt and to believe. Believe by faith. The word of God tells us Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He says, I tell you the truth, if you have faith, faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And with God, nothing will be impossible for you. In closing, so what happened to Thomas following his personal experience, revelation, and confession of the risen Jesus? We're told immediately following his confession of heartfelt belief, Jesus commended the life-giving choice uh, made by his disciple, Thomas had the privilege of being an eyewitness. But, Je but Jesus then offered this blessing, this blessing on all those future believers, future believers like us, who have not seen, not privileged to have seen like Thomas, and yet have believed, based upon the evidence, based upon the evidence. The Bible doesn't tell us what specifically happened to Thomas after his encounter with the risen Jesus and after Pentecost, but what Christian tradition tells us from history are these things. Thomas became an outspoken advocate and evangelist for the Lord Jesus to share and be the good news. Thomas preached in ancient Babylon, which is known as modern-day Iraq. He then traveled to Persia, modern-day Iran, and continued to win followers to the risen Jesus. Thomas then sailed to the west coast of India. It's thought to have been around 52 AD, where he, similar to the Apostle Paul, he preached he established churches and was used by the Lord God to help many come to believe and trust in Jesus. In fact, when the Portuguese later came to India in the early 1600s, they, what they found was a group of Christians already there from what was known as the Mar Thoma Church that had been started by Thomas's ministry 
roughly some 1,500 years earlier. And finally, we're told that Thomas traveled to the east coast of India, where he continued to preach the good news of Jesus, and also where he died for his faith. Thomas was martyred and went home to be with the Lord, somewhere thought to have been 70, around 72 AD. Thomas's life for all of us is a powerful example, especially for today in these uncertain times of what can happen when we choose to allow the risen Jesus to move us, to move us from beyond the shadow of our doubt. Let us close at this time in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love and mercy. Thank you that you died for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you that you rose from the dead to give each of us a new life in you and that you are truly alive. Lord Jesus, help us, especially in these uncertain times, to take to heart the lessons from Thomas's life. Help us to take to heart that you patiently, patiently invite us to draw near to you and to come and see for ourselves who you are and what you have done. And that we can draw near to you and release to you our doubts, our questions. Help us, Lord Jesus, to take to heart that you also challenge us, just like Thomas, based upon the evidence of your birth, your life, your death and resurrection, to trust you to trust you by faith with our lives and to step beyond, to step out of the shadow of unresolved doubt and into the light of your presence, the light of your truth. Help us to receive the fullness of your blessing of abundant life and eternal life. And help us, Lord, help us, Lord Jesus, to be your blessing to a world still filled with darkness, despair, and doubt. Use us, Lord Jesus, in the midst of these times we live in. We ask all of these things in your name we pray. Amen. And hear the blessing of the Lord for you this day. From Numbers chapter 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you all for uh, watching, uh, listening to the message this morning. Uh, may you all have a blessed week uh, and we'll see you all soon.